Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for, for coming in. I know it's a little packed, but uh, you know, thankfully these will be recorded and, and everyone can also see it uh, otherwise as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm Anurag and I'm joined with Eduardo uh, and we are maintainers of the FluentBit project. And I guess some questions to, to kick it off. How many folks here know what FluentBit is? Or, and keep your hand raised. Are you using it today? Okay, a couple less hands, good. Uh, awesome. So what we'll do today, we're going to go over the project a little bit, and then we'll run through some of the updates that we've done, uh, you know, specifically talking about some of the integrations that have come in the latest version released yesterday. Uh, and then last but not least, we'll, we'll save some good time for, for demo here. So again, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the maintainers, Anurag, and then I'm joined with Eduardo. Uh, we both work for the company Calyptia, uh, and so we've been here doing FluentD, FluentBit, uh, and, and very much in the space of telemetry, logs, metrics, traces for, for quite a while. So really excited to, to get to chat with everyone here. And you know, kind of starting at a very high level, what is the, the complexity of telemetry data, right? The, the idea behind all of this data that we're getting, it's really so we can go do some data analytics, data analysis, what's going wrong, troubleshooting, have a really nice understanding of what's happening within the environment. And ideally, when you understand what's happening, you're able to make better decisions, whether those are business related, whether those are for operational purposes. Uh, and, and to do this, really, we look at the challenges that occur with this. You have multiple sources. You know, everyone here might have a different logging library. Uh, you might be logging uh, XYZ. You might be instrumenting your application in a certain way. There's different languages. And we have tons and tons of different data formats. So, the more that we continue to produce and create the software, we are continually expounding and, and increasing the challenges in order to understand what's what's going on. And you know, a lot of folks might uh, say, "Oh, there's there's profiling, there's others," but really, let's if we focus on the three major verticals of telemetry data, you have your logs, things that have been there for for long, long periods of time, metrics as well. Uh, things that kind of detail how a specific application might be running, could be custom metrics about uh, something within the business, and more recently you have the, the tracing uh, vertical, so uh, things about your application, how a response might be, be going. Uh, and if we look at how these three types of telemetry uh, have evolved over time, really it's, it's, you know, from a logging level, you're getting things like your raw text logs, your sys logs, your system D, uh, you're getting all of these kernel logs and, and it's trying to tell you, as the word log implies, of what is happening within that, that system. Uh, you know, thankfully we're starting to get some more structure with, with things like OpenTelemetry, which we'll touch on in, in a bit, but things like JSON and, and other types of formats have kind of helped us to understand how these logs are evolving over, over time. Now, from a, a metrics side, this has been, again, something that's evolved over, over the past few years, right? We're looking at two types of things. One is what is happening from maybe a performance standpoint? What's happening from a business perspective? How many users are signing up? How many users are, are leveraging the platform? And those help us to build things like alerting. And typically, when we're doing these type of telemetry observability scenarios, we're starting with that alert, we're, we're looking at what happened and, and then deriving the metrics, looking at the logs, looking at tracing information. Uh, and we have a lot of different types of these metrics. So folks who might remember all the stuff going on with uh, CPU metrics back in the day, you have things going on with StatsD. Uh, really, we've, we've kind of cornered into the four common data types around metrics, your counters, gauges, histograms, summaries, uh, things that, that are very well known within that Prometheus and again, Otel ecosystem. Uh, traces, so now we're, as we continue to build applications that are distributed, not just on a single uh, server, really we wanna understand how things are flowing through a system, service mapping, how long steps are taking, are we spending a lot of time talking to a database, spending a lot of time talking to a particular end application. Uh, and within that Im implementation, we're seeing a lot of awesome things around spans, attributes, uh, and, and even things with extended Ber Berkeley packet filter eBPF, where now you don't even have to instrument some of that code, it can be done for you, or looking at that, that kernel level. So all in all, you know, we're have, we have a ton of stuff where we're continually building all these different data sets, data pieces, 
Uh, and if we look at what, what's out there, and many of these tools are going to look familiar. You have FluentBit, FluentD, uh, rsyslog, things that are just their standard out of the box. Uh, on the metrics side, of course, we have Prometheus, OpenMetrics, Nagios. Uh, and then tracing side, we have open telemetry, open tracing. Uh, and you know, if everyone here has come to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation KubeCon event. Uh, you know, it's really great to see we have such awesome communities that are building on top of each of those different pillars of observability, even others, uh, and, and really trying to address each of those problems from a you know best of breed type type of scenario. Now, with that, you know, the challenges that we're starting to see, or at least you know, what we've seen is folks, again, multiple sources, multiple formats, data is growing year over year, and not all of it, to be honest, is it should be treated the same way. Sometimes I'll accidentally put a console logger for hello or something just to see that it's, it's working or hitting that path, but that's not useful for someone else debugging the application, and if I accidentally leave it on, it can generate tons and tons of expensive data. Uh, back pressure, you know, we, where you're in an environment where we're continuously sending all of this data, how do we handle the fact that some of this data is, is being generated faster than we can even send it out? Uh, and then from a Kubernetes standpoint, right, we're introducing all these different architectures. We need to get more and more data off the machine. We're packing up these Kubernetes nodes with even more containers and pods, uh, resource utilization, speed, different architectures, whether it's ARM, x86, these things start to come into mind with making sure that we're leveraging all of this uh, to the full extent. So again, at a, at a high level, that's where all of this telemetry sits. Now, from a fluent bit side, what we've been looking at trying to address a lot of these challenges, this project created about 2015, and initially it was built for embedded Linux, right, where Kubernetes had just kind of been open sourced. IoT was the big thing back then and said, great, let's make something for embedded devices, IoT, let's get that data. The resource utilization should be super small, less than a megabyte. Well, it turns out that embedded Linux is a great environment similar to a container. Low resource utilization, super lightweight, uh, something that you want to have that's not taking up too much, not noisiness. And that's really where FluentBit evolved. And from there, it's just kind of taken off. We've, we've seen so much usage throughout containerized environments, Kubernetes, even older environments like your, your Red Hats, your embedded Linux, uh, Red Hat 6 specifically. The, wow, I, I didn't expect to keep seeing that out there, but hey, it's, it's prevalent and, and running. Uh, so that's, that's where this, this project has kind of come into play. And as it, as it has, we've been continually expanding it to meet those telemetry use cases. So, from you know, the inception, actually, it wasn't logs. Everyone thinks, yeah, FluentBit started with logs. It was actually with metrics. We did JSON-based metrics to show things like heat, kernel-level metrics, CPU, memory. And that was for you know, your IoT devices. Are they performing well? Are they overheating? Uh, they were log-based metrics. But then all of a sudden, folks said, hey, this lightweight package is great. Can we tail the log file? Can we actually get that system information? And so logs was, was added. And then from a metric side, Prometheus started exploding. Well, we want to make sure we integrate really well with that ecosystem. So we added Prometheus scraping. We added node exporter metrics, Windows exporter metrics, uh, the ability to remote write to a Prometheus endpoint, or even export those metrics over an HTTP endpoint if you already have scrapers in places. And now with traces and, and kind of the, the open telemetry wave that's going on where we're finally getting some really nice protocols and schemas for all of these data signals, we've added that support. Make sure that, hey, from a tracing standpoint, you're going to be able to do open telemetry input, logs, metrics, traces, output log, metrics, traces. Uh, so again, this kind of cohesive way of adding and, and combining all these different ecosystems. Again, from a background perspective, uh, a lot of folks are leveraging uh, FluentBit all over the place. Uh, you know, spin up ECS, EKS, uh, GKE. If you're using Azure, their networking service, Azure Mariner, which is open source, is using it. Uh, and, and then again, a ton of other companies within different, different verticals. Um, and so this is where we've been focusing from a project standpoint. How can we continue to address the challenges of increasing telemetry data, connect those two ecosystems that might be a little different, that have these different uh, sources, different destinations, and make sure that 
from your perspective, it might sound anti what we're, what we're showing here, but you don't really have to think about an agent. You're thinking about how can we make better analytics, better business decisions, how can we make sure that we're servicing our end users with the highest grade of, of, of software operations. So we're in the background, we're in the infrastructure level, uh, we just wanna be that, that easy kind of click uh, and, and usage side. Now from the, the ecosystem side, again, we're, we're really trying to plug into what's out there and what folks are using. Uh, we're trying to make sure that you're not locked in. So if you think uh, you're using X backend today and you wanna use Y backend tomorrow, excellent. Let's make sure that that, that can work really well. Uh, and then work on, on top of these different uh, products, on top of these different platforms, uh, and on top of those, those different projects. So with that, let me hand it off to Eduardo to talk uh, very sp specifically about what's in 2.1 and how that helps uh, kind of keep that story alive with all the telemetry. Thank you. Well, it's exciting times. I'm most excited after lunch, right? I know that oh, we're getting tired. You know, all rooms has been packed. So let's go into do some quick updates around the project and then try to do some demos so you can see uh, what is new, mostly for people who is aware about the project. So today we're launching Fluentbit 2.1, right? The major release 2 was uh, around November last year and now 2.1. At the end of the year, we're planning to have 3.0. Now, one of the biggest features that people was asking for a long time, I would say four years, or five years ago, from the beginning is that hot reload support. And now Fluentbit finally has a hot reload support, so you can do a trigger through a SIGHAP signal or just through the HTTP endpoint. Yeah, security guys, yeah, you have to enable this in the configuration, it's not there by default. Of course, no, but you don't want that somebody just make a request and restart your agent, right? Uh, one of the problems that people had is like, hey, I have this application that is shipping a metric, but as a log. Maybe it's shipping a JSON that says, my counter equals five, then six. But they wanted to expose this in Grafana, right? So you wanted to ingest this into Prometheus as a metric, and we didn't have that way. Now with this new filter, you can convert any type of log uh, like a, a, to a metric, it could be support counters, gauges, histograms. It's pretty flexible, you can define the, the metric name, the description, and so on. For Windows lovers, or companies who love Windows, also we extended the support of uh, Windows metrics. I think that we are a few uh, agents around that is exposing Windows metrics. And this is getting a lot of traction recently. Uh, we're excited, I'm not excited about Windows, but I'm excited that people can get this, this type of functionality. And now the different uh, collectors and scrapers for Windows can be um, you know, configured at different intervals of time. And yeah, we are supporting Windows on ARM64. Yeah, this is kind of new, but it's something that's going to hit in the next year, at least for, uh, for servers. And I think that I skip one slide. Oh no, I'm good. So uh, I don't know if you're aware about Podman. Podman is a project started by Red Hat to run containers. Yeah, it's pretty compatible with, with Docker, but same as Docker, Podman exposed metrics. So how do you monitor your containers that are running under Podman? So now Fluentbit has a plugin that you can scrape natively the Podman metrics and expose them through Prometheus, Remote Write, Open Telemetry Metrics, or any kind of format that we support for the metrics output side. Also, uh, Fluentbit used to just uh, have the knowledge of every record or event contains a timestamp when this was generated or when it happened, plus the, con the content of the record or th of the event. But recently, people started to think on microservices, and you know, in microservices, what is important is the concept of context, right? And how do we present context in the data that is being generated? It's called metadata. Right? Usually a context uh, for people who are not configuring something could be a label that says color equals blue, right? or any other type. Since uh, OpenTelemetry was released and they released, the, this is a real story, they released the, the spec for logs, right? they separated metadata from the content. So, and that led us to adapt our new, our new internal format without breaking changes to support metadata inside the log. So right now, for example, Fluentbit can receive open telemetry logs, right, from the input side and send it out, and you're not going to lose any data. Metadata will be there and the content will be there. 
And one of the use cases uh, of Fluentbit, this is quite crazy, right? So we have a JavaScript application sending open template metrics and trace it to Fluentbit, which is sending to Jaeger, but also we have a Prometheus scripting metric from Fluentbit, which also is shipping this information out to an open telemetry collector. Right? So Fluentbit is quite versatile on, this, uh, on these scenarios. As I always said, it's not a drop-in replacement for something that you have in your environment. Actually, it helps you to augment and extract more value from it. At the end of the day, I see I never seen a production environment that just has one tool or one database. I don't think so. You always find MySQL, PostgreSQL, Redis, Memcache, whatever, right? In this space, it's the same. You won't have one tool, but you have one common problem. How do you correlate the information? How do you collect all the information together? And this is one tool to solve that problem. It can collect, but also can aggregate. Okay, and with the updates of 2.1, you know that Fluentbit can collect data, process data, and send the data out. The process, we used to do that with filters. And the thing is that from a global perspective, you can see that the data flows through an input on a source inside Fluentbit, it goes through a filtering process and then go to the output destination. And we support between input, output, and filters more than 100 built-in plugins. Now, if we go to more technical terms, the input plugins and the output plugins can run in separate threads. Because of course, nowadays, your computer might have more than one CPU core and you want to take advantage of that, right? So since we have this, you might see that all the filtering was happening in the engine. Right? So the engine at some point, if you're doing so much filtering, can become uh, a bottleneck. We have seen use cases like with 30 filters, 40 filters, and I'm not kidding, in customer's environment. And it was, wow, that is huge, right? So we need to think about, in a way, how to optimize this. And we come up with the concept of processors. Processors are kind of filters, but that runs attached to the input plugins and runs attached to the output plugins too. So in the input, no matter what you generate, so log, metrics, or traces, you can do any kind of processing. The output of that can optionally go to the filtering phase, go to the destination, but it will be reprocessed again. Now, what is the, you can say, but why do I need to process in the output again? Because the thing is that we support multiple outputs at the same time, and sometimes you would like to filter out certain information for certain destination. And you don't want to do it in the input, you want it to do it in the output, most advanced use cases. Okay, and this is reflected in the configuration. Yeah, I started showing the new YAML configuration. So just as simple, you can, for example, for logs, you can run a Lua script. Yeah, we, we support scripting in Fluentbit, but also for node exporter, which is scraping metrics, we can add labels. And now I'm going to do um, a quick demo, but after that, we are happy to announce that we got a little traction in the latest years, and today we're announcing that we hit 6.3 billion downloads of Fluentbit in a few years. So this is uh, a lot. Well, thank you. you. <laughs> I'm just concerned that at some point Docker Hub is going to send us the bill, right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, hands on. I think that you just got your Fluentbit t-shirt, right? So we're good, let's jump into the terminal. Okay, I think that we have a couple of minutes left, um, so I'm going to do this in a very, I will try to do it in a very quick way. Can you read the screen? Yes or no, or maybe. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. People in the last line, in the row, can you see it? You have good glasses, you don't have glasses, man. Okay. Okay, I'm going to show uh, how this works from a configuration perspective. Okay, I'm going to open my new terminal that is here. Oh, this is too small. Let me close this one and maybe. Do, 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 do. Okay, how this works? Fluentbit defines a configuration that has a service section, and then you define a pipeline. Same as you have one pipeline, you can have two or multiple. Okay, but you need to be careful about routing but we're not going to touch that part right now. In this example, what I'm going to do, uh, have you used Node Exporter from Prometheus? Have you had the need to scrape metrics from a file? 
before? Okay, because you're using new technology, but if you're going to talk to other 5,000 folks around, they have been scraping metrics from a text file because their application ships metrics to a file. So one of the new additions in Fluent Bit 2.1 is the ability in the not exported metrics plugin that we have, which mimics the Prometheus one, uh, trans full transparency. We copy paste the source code in Go in C, in C Fluent Bit. And this was a joint work with the Prometheus folks. That's the best part. Right now, uh, so we added the collector for text file. So if you go here, go to my example number one, uh, the Prometheus format is pretty straightforward. It's like a text file that defines, you know, help, a type, the name of the, the name of the metric, and then some value. This is, of course, is a counter. So what I'm going to do in this first example, you know, my input is not exporting metrics, okay? I'm going to scrape a text file. I'm going to disable uh, everything else. And, and this is the name of the file. In the output side, I'm sending the, the information out to three places. I'm going to expose it as a Prometheus exporter. Maybe we can skip that part because of time to a standard output, but also I'm going to forward, send over the network, this metrics to a place over the forward protocol. And that place, uh, I'm going to take the time to announce a new open source project that we have uh, in the company that is called Vivo. Do you know what Vivo means in Spanish or in Italian? Vivo means alive, right? I don't know if you got uh, this problem sometimes that you want to see your data, but you don't want to deploy Elastic, Grafana, Prometheus, blah, 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 blah. Well, maybe you weren't in our same foot. Yeah, Vivo is a project that you just deploy, you send the data, and just runs in memory. It doesn't have a storage, but you can see the data that is available. Okay, so I'm going to take the opportunity to use it uh, for this demo. We just released the version today, so the UI might have some, some glitches in there. But what I'm going to do is send data to Vivo. So Vivo, actually, what, the, what it does, uh, we don't have a slide for that, but it runs fluent bit. So use Fluent Bit to collect the data, and then we have a web UI that scrapes the data from Fluent Bit and shows it in this uh, React application. So running this, I'm going to say, uh, scrape the metrics. I'm going to run here, and there we go. This the information should be here on metrics. I can it refresh up after five to two, seven seconds. There we go. So the metrics that we have in Vivo. We use and uh, we represent as a JSON, but we use the internal Fluent Bit representation for a metric. Yeah, might not be ideal. I know that. Hey, what are you using Prometheus or other? Yeah, I think we're going to enhance that. But you can see that the metrics is flowing, and the data is here. So we just scrape from a file, take the metrics, convert it. Sorry, a metric from a file, convert it, and send it out to Vivo as a native uh, metric. One of the cases that we get also, uh, people said, I don't know if you're familiar with metrics, but if you're using a metric backend or a vendor, you have the concept of dimensions, indexing. As many dimensions you have, more money you pay. Uh, are you using Datadog? Are you facing this problem? You are facing this problem, yeah. actually. Yeah, if I go to US and ask the same question, everybody will raise their hands, right? It's a market thing. But the problem is that when you have more dimension, it's more expensive to run queries because you have to do more, more indexing, you know, across different endpoints. And in metrics, dimensions are given by labels. But guess what? Developers love to add labels. Color, car, model, year, and you don't need all of those, but you ended up paying for those. So in, in labels, also in the opposite problem, it's like you don't have labels and you want to add dimensions. So you want to play with this modification. So in Fluent Bit 2.1, in the processors, we have processor for metrics, and we have a processor that is called labels that pretty much can update, delete, or update uh, a label. The absurd, you know what is absurd? What absurd does? SQL guys. Update or create, update or insert, really good. Awesome. So we're going to do in this second demo is take the same metrics, but enrich it with this label. If I go here, because I send this repeatedly, you will find that the labels are not there. 
right? So what I'm going to do is to run this second example. Uh, I have the same metrics. And I'm going to do something that's refresh, because it's new, right? We don't want any kind of messy data here. And after refreshing the data, you will see that well, we had to wait a couple of seconds. The new matrix entry that we got here will have the color blue uh, in place in the levels. Oh, this was not the one. The one. Let me close. Yeah, it, this should not be here. It should be the other side. Let me hear here. I don't know if it's adding the, the record at the beginning or at the bottom. It seems at the bottom. Mm. Yeah. And if it's not working here, my apologies. So we will have to fix view. But as usual, also we have our standard output that should never fail. Name std out match everything. Uh, labels color blue. So if we take a look at the std out output, we will see that the labels should be there. And here we go. The label for that dimension is there that was not there in the file, so this is a back in vivo. We have the first back. You know, that's the risk of live, live demos, but it's good because we get feedback. Now, when processing logs, also um, we got the same problem. It's like how we can enrich data. Uh, are you using a Splunk or any kind of expensive uh, backend? Yeah. I don't want to ask how much you're paying for Splunk because I don't want to feel you <laughs> bad. But uh, how, how much data are you doing just per day? Gigabytes or terabytes. Gigabytes. Are you using all those gigabytes? No. no. Actually, there is a normal standard that says from the 100% that you ingest into Splunk, usually you query 20% of it, but you pay for the 100. And why this happens? Because people just send data. Developers send data. Debug, hello world, and there you go, and you end up paying the bill. And But the problem is with logs is like, if you don't have a way to control the flow of data, you're getting a problem because every year, every company is generating 20 to 30% more logs. That's it. Because yeah, you have more microservices, more applications. So having control of this is really important. And for example, in this example, uh, for logs, we have a Lua script. <coughs> Maybe you are familiar with Nginx, you have done some Lua scripting in the configuration, but if not, this is a really simple language that runs in the configuration or in a file where you can define arrays, maps. Well, this is called Lua tables. Lua is a Brazilian language which is really easy to go with. So basically what this is doing, I'm going to show the file that is called test.log. Let me close this previous example. And test.log is a, it says, we have a JSON map, maybe I can see here. You know, it's conference, KubeCon, where, the year, and the status by now. Now, if we go and run this example, and we go to logs, we're going to see the record. But now we see that it's not by now, it's sold out, same as this room. And why it got sold out? Because we run a processing rule inside the input that changes the name sorry, the value of status. And if you recall here, status, what was? By now. Same as we can modify content in traces, in metrics, we can do it also in logs. Now, when is this more useful? Oh, you're talking about cost reduction, but you are also modifying the data. You can drop data. So you can say if something contains debug, if something uh, has something that doesn't have any important meaning for the company, you just can drop it. Or may even better, you can route the data they don't, don't care today to a cheaper storage. Amazon S3, Kafka, or any kind of fancy database that you can have in a, your environment. And I don't know if we have time because, what, how many minutes we have? We have three minutes for Q&A? Okay, so I think we can use three minutes for Q&A because it's well deserved. 
we got a ton of slides of content here. <laughs> you know, next time we will ask for a block of two hours with a room for a thousand people. Is this uh, hello, hello? I, uh, any questions? Does anyone have questions? Or? Yeah. Uh, it's regarding authentication. Uh, with FluentD, it's important that you can authenticate to uh, Elasticsearch using uh, certificate. Is that something that could come to Fluent Bit? So you can uh, yeah, pre assign the certifi certificate and then you can authenticate to uh, Elasticsearch or OpenSearch. Yeah, so uh, from a certificate side, we support. Uh, uh, TLS, basic auth, AWS auth, uh, and I believe there's a CA key as well. But maybe, yeah, we might need to get into the specific weeds of it, but uh, yeah, happy to, happy to take a look. We've made a lot of improvements from FluentD and FluentBit, so folks who've wanted to migrate over um, for the lesser resource utilization to stuff like Otel and Prometheus. Uh, so we knocked out the biggest one, which was input TLS. Um, and so that was knocked out last October. So if there's more, let's go uh, go tackle those as well. Any other questions folks have? Happy to come to you. Okay, we'll be up here. Great, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.